have Francois Saylor from uh, Laval and uh, a trio from the New York area. And then our discussion afterwards is the T-shirt Rai about at uh, Queens College. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over to Francois. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for uh, organizing this and uh, being here. I'm very thankful for uh, the opportunity. So um, today I'm presenting uh, Slavery, Political Attitudes and Social Capital, Evidence from Brazil. Uh, and this is meant to be the second chapter in a series of papers on the abolition of slavery in Brazil, uh, using new data on local votes uh, from the emancipation period. So in the first chapter uh, with Arthur Silva, we look at the role of uh, intraday divergence as a driver of institutional change and the importance this divergence had uh, in precipitating the collapse of slavery in Brazil. And here, I am uh, mostly interested in the investigating the long-term influence of uh, labor coercion, looking specifically at social capital as a persistence mechanism. So first, um, a few words on motivation. So uh, there are several reasons uh, why we may expect uh, coercive labor institutions to have uh, persistent influence on development. A first reason that has been the object of uh, long literature is that coercion may distort incentives uh, and the allocation of resources, which may have a long lasting impact on uh, the economy. A second channel, uh, which is the one I'm uh, most interested in in this paper, is that coercion may also have uh, hampered social capital and engendered weaker norm norms of uh, cooperation. So uh, Brazil offers a quite compelling setting to study the legacy of slavery. It's the last country uh, to abolish slavery in the Western Hemisphere, and it's by far the country that participated the most uh, in the Atlantic slave trade, uh, with more than 5.5 million slaves uh, arriving in Brazil between the 16th and the 19th century. Um, that being said, identifying the, the impact of slavery in Brazil is uh, particularly challenging in part because of the endogeneity of slavery, uh, which is that slaves were brought to the most uh, economically dynamic regions. And also I think because of the data we have. So we typically only observe uh, slavery as an 1872 cross-section, uh, which is already relatively close to the abolition period and only after uh, the Atlantic slave trade has been uh, shut down, uh, which led most slaves to be concentrated in the most productive regions uh, for the cultivation of coffee. So there's a bit of a, an identification challenge here. And I think uh, this paper uh, kind of contributes to that by tackling the problem from a, a slightly different angle. So the main uh, research question of the paper is, uh, what is the cultural, political, and institutional legacy of labor coercion? And uh, more specifically, do institutions of legal coercion continue to shape norms of social and political behavior long after their extinction? And to provide a new perspective on these questions, I propose to complement the existing uh, extensive margin measure uh, of the prevalence of slavery. So how many slaves were there uh, with a sort of intensive margin measure, uh, which is how strong were local uh, political interest for the continuation of coercive institutions. With the idea, of course, uh, that slavery may have had a larger impact uh, in places where support for coercive institutions uh, was uh, greater. Uh, main findings. Uh, so to measure uh, political support uh, for coercive institutions, I exploit uh, roll call votes on emancipation related bills before the abolition of slavery in 1888. And I relate this to both historical and contemporary economic, social, and political outcomes. And I find that uh, slavery is more strongly negatively associated uh, with economic outcomes in places where legislators refused to convert to abolitionism. Um, and that slavery and support for coercion appear to have durably affected uh, social capital. So I think I'll have to be a bit brief uh, on the, the literature, but I think this paper uh, mostly con uh, contributes to the literature on the long run consequences of coercive labor arrangements on development uh, on the one hand, and also on uh, the literature on the influence of historical events on uh, cultural norms of behavior, social capital and political attitudes. So usually before uh, turning to the data, uh, I would spend some time discussing the historical uh, context. So for the sake of brevity, I'll just uh, mention that at the time, Brazil was a constitutional monarchy uh, with a quite oligarchical uh, political system, largely dominated uh, by a planter elite, uh, which relied uh, for a very long time on uh, coerced labor. Uh, 
So this certainly explains uh, why Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery uh, in the Americas, in spite uh, of very strong domestic and international pressure. So abolition was the result of uh, a very drawn out uh, legislative battle, uh, which is something I captured in my data. So I link archival voting data to historical and contemporary covariates and outcomes. I use uh, voting decisions on emancipation related build, bills uh, to build a measure of average abolition voting at the electoral district level, uh, which proxies for the local support uh, to coercive institutions. And this constitutes uh, the, the arguably the central uh, explanatory variable uh, of the paper. I also use a number of historical and geographical covariates, uh, in particular, uh, the other most important uh, explanatory variable uh, captures uh, the local prevalence of slavery using the share of slaves and the share of slaves employed uh, in agriculture in 1872 from uh, the, the first census of the empire of Brazil. And then uh, I also mainly use uh, a number of geographic uh, and uh, demographic controls. In terms of outcomes, I first look at a number of uh, socioeconomic outcomes, uh, mainly GDP, um, poverty, which is measured as the share of individuals uh, living with less than 50% the minimum uh, wage uh, in uh, 1991, the tail index as a measure of uh, inequality, and uh, so on. In terms of political outcomes, I mainly use uh, turnout in presidential elections and ideology of the most voted, voted party in local elections. And to measure ideology, I use uh, a, a scale uh, developed by Power and Zucco, which classifies uh, the ideology of Brazilian parties on a zero to 10 uh, left right uh, index. And then a number of uh, social capital outcomes, uh, namely generalized trust, uh, self positioning on the left right scale, a view on democracy, on autocracy, and so on. Moving on to the empirical approach. Here are the baseline specifications. And a particular difficulty uh, of this type of approach is the matching of geographical units over time. And here I match modern municipalities to the original uh, historical municipalities from which uh, they originated, and these municipalities to historical electoral districts. So districts are the largest encompassing units, and so everything will be clustered uh, at the district level. So here, uh, why is any given outcome uh, in contemporary municipality J, uh, historical municipality K, historical uh, electoral district D and state S. Uh, capital S is the prevalence of slavery uh, in municipality K. And A uh, is my aggregate measure of the willingness to abolish uh, slavery in district D. And so A increases with pro-abolition voting and it is continuous and equal to one uh, when a legislator systematically, systematically voted in favor of emancipation. Then X, uh, Z, and W are uh, all vectors of covariates at uh, different levels. And importantly, delta are state fixed effects. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I either cluster standard errors at the district level or use uh, Conley uh, spatial heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation robust standard errors. So a few words on uh, threats to identification. So up to now, uh, a causal interpretation of the association between slavery prevalence, uh, political support for abolition and contemporary outcomes uh, requires assuming that both the allocation of slaves and of pro-abolition votes across municipalities uh, within states is as good as random, uh, conditionally on pre-existing uh, geographic, political and demographic control. So I think this is plausible, uh, but by no means guaranteed. Uh, so I think it's plausible because once an observed heterogeneity across states uh, is absorbed by uh, state fixed effects, and once geographical factors uh, such as uh, soil suitability, ruggedness uh, or remoteness, and uh, political factors such as party loyalty or demographic factors uh, such as uh, education or uh, population composition are all accounted for, uh, any remaining variation driving the allocation of slaves and votes might be indeed exogenous uh, and as good as random. However, uh, there are several possible threats to identification. So first, uh, because uh, voting on abolition related bills is an outcome of the prevalence of slavery, we may worry about uh, bad controls in the sense uh, of Engrist and Pischke. So in, if um, 
if uh, abolition-related re voting is about control, it would bias the relationship between slavery and the outcomes I consider. So I think this is unlikely uh, because for it to be about control, uh, there would also need to be some mechanism uh, of reverse causation between the outcomes and uh, pro-abolition voting, which I think in this case is uh, unlikely, um, but still. So second, uh, I, although uh, reverse causation seems unlikely here, we may worry about omitted variables. And uh, in particular, the main issue I have in mind is that there might be some unobserved uh, substates, uh, or, um, progressive cultures, uh, progressive culture in some specific area, driving simultaneously the allocation of slaves, uh, the voting behavior of legislators, and modern economic outcomes. So again, I think uh, this is a bit unlikely because ultimately I'm interested in comparing uh, areas with uh, high prevalence of slavery, but uh, still this might be an issue. So in this setting, uh, we have potentially three endogenous variables, the share of slaves, the voting decisions of legislators, and the interaction between these two. And to plausibly establish causality, I use a two-pronged uh, instrumental variable, variable strategy with a standard uh, instrument for slavery and then heteroscedasticity based instruments uh, to identify the rest of the model. So I think I won't have too much time to get into the specifics of the instrument, but regarding the slavery instrument, the idea is to predict at the local level the allocation of slaves across administrative units based on determinants uh, that predate by far uh, the period during which we observe slavery and voting decisions and that were no longer significant past the 19th century. So to do that, uh, I exploit the variation induced by 18th century gold supply roads, uh, which were roads that were built by slaves across the country uh, during the, the 18th century gold rush, and they altered economic activities uh, near these roads. But at the time, uh, a very large part of Brazil was not colonized, and uh, so this works mostly for early settlement municipalities. So to circumscribe uh, this variation to early settlement municipalities, I also interacted, uh, uh, so this distance to gold path with areas of indigenous people's repression during the early days of the colonization of Brazil. And the idea here is that uh, when uh, Portuguese settlers colonized Brazil, they enslaved and ended up uh, either exterminating or driving out the populations of Tupis and Guaranis that lived in, in the, along the Brazilian coastline. So we know that places uh, where indig indigenous peoples uh, were driven out between the 16th and the 18th century were like, likely to have afterwards uh, received settlers and slaves uh, from the African slave trade. And the main ident identification assumption here is that conditionally on controlled and fixed effects, this should not influence the outcomes we consider other than through uh, its effects on slavery. Uh, here, I think it's likely, uh, mostly because first, uh, well, gold path ceased to matter shortly af after the independence of Brazil and uh, the end of the, the gold rush. So they did not retain a significant, import significant importance uh, for economic activity uh, past the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, indigenous peoples were uniformly driven out uh, from the Brazilian coastline. So by the end of the 18th century, there wasn't any Tupi uh, left in the in slavery intensive regions. So that again, uh, indigenous repression is unlikely to have durably affected the outcomes I evaluate. And to instrument the rest of the possibly endogenous variables, I rely on heteroscedasticity based instruments uh, following the approach proposed by Lubo. And here the idea is to leverage uh, heteroscedasticity with respect uh, to exogenous regressors in first stage estimates. So um, this basically relies on a conditional variance uh, rather than on uh, first conditional moments like uh, traditional instruments. Okay, so turning to the results. I start by briefly discussing some uh, graphical evidence. So this figure uh, plots the marginal effect of the share of slaves in 1872 on municipality level GDP uh, nearly 100 years later in 1970 as a function of legislators' uh, average uh, voting decisions on abolition bills. So it turns out that uh, the marginal effect of slavery on GDP is much stronger um, in municipalities that were represented uh, by anti-abolitionist legislators uh, several decades uh, earlier. So according to this figure, uh, for the, the figure in the top left, uh, 
which is on total GDP, uh, in a systematically abolitionist municipality, a one percentage point increase in the share of slaves in 1872 is associated with a nearly 20 million decrease in municipal uh, GDP in 1970. So overall, slavery appears to be negatively associated with economic wealth in the long run. And this relationship is significantly stronger uh, in municipalities that featured stronger uh, support for coercive institutions at the time of emancipation. And these municipalities also uh, appear more unequal and to have a higher share of poor individuals today. Uh, this is especially true for uh, former plantation municipalities, as uh, can be seen on these figures here. So uh, these figures uh, are binned scatter plots of the relationship between the municipality level share of poor individuals in 1991 and the share of slaves employed in agriculture in 1872. And the, the relationship on the left panel is slightly negative, uh, but it's actually insignificant whereas it's actually positive and significant on the right panel. So in other words, uh, the historical prevalence of slavery is associated with increased poverty today whenever uh, legislators uh, strongly supported the, the, the continuation of coercive institutions. So here, uh, this first table uh, echoes the first plot uh, I showed. Uh, this shows the influence of slavery and support for coercion on GDP in 2000. And again, Overall, uh, this shows that all else equal, slavery is much more strongly negatively associated with GDP in places uh, that uh, supported coercion in, uh, in uh, the abolition period. So in this table, I further investigate uh, this relationship for a subset of uh, development outcomes. Overall, um, this shows that people tend to fare better in places uh, where support for coercive institu institutions was lower. Uh, so maintaining constant uh, slavery prevalence. Poverty tends to be lower in municipalities uh, that showed greater support for emancipation and uh, inequality tends to be higher in anti-abolition municipalities. These are uh, the two SLS results, which tend to be slightly larger, uh, but overall very close to the OLS results. Uh, and endogeneity tests generally do not allow rejecting the null hypothesis that endogenous regressors uh, can be treated as exogenous. And these are the results for the main uh, political outcomes I consider, uh, namely participation and partisanship. So bearing in mind uh, the literature on the influence of repression on political attitudes, the first thing uh, we might have expected if descendants of slaves had stayed in these uh, strongly anti-abolitionist municipalities is uh, some sort of political backlash on the parties most associated uh, with slavery. And here, uh, the evidence tends to uh, weakly point uh, to the opposite, which is that although individuals from high prevalence and high support for coercion uh, municipalities uh, were more likely to participate uh, in 1994 elections, they were also more likely to elect uh, representatives from less redistributive, more conservative parties in 1996 although uh, any, none of these effects uh, is still significant by 2000. So um, places that were conservative uh, back then are still conservative today, or they tend to be more conservative today, despite the fact that the overwhelming majority of the population was disenfranchised back then. So uh, this kind of evokes uh, the Brazilian historiography, which tends to indicate that uh, many former slaves left these places and moved to the cities uh, after emancipation, which may contribute to explain uh, why these places do not elect more redistributive policies or parties uh, in spite of the median voter being poor on average. Finally, the evidence on social capital uh, is consistent with the idea that uh, cultural norms associated with lower cooperation and uh, weaker institutions may have been transmitted across generations and uh, still negatively affect social capital uh, today. So for example, according to uh, column two, in an average municipality, a standard deviation increase in pro-abolition voting uh, is associated with uh, an, a 0.8 percentage point increase in the probabil probability that the respondent uh, answers that most people can be trusted, uh, which actually corresponds to a 20% increase above uh, the sample mean. So overall, individuals living uh, in slavery prevalent municipalities with stronger support for coercion are still less trusting today, and they are much more likely to believe uh, that democracy is not necessarily uh, the best type of government uh, 
and that corruption may be acceptable uh, under some circumstances uh, and so on. So to conclude, um, I investigated uh, the long-term influence of coercive labor institutions and political support uh, for their continuation in Brazil. And uh, the evidence is consistent uh, with coercive institutions having induced significantly low, lower levels of uh, social capital in these municipalities. All right, thank you, Francois. Uh, so the last paper uh, is by Ali Ahmed, Marcus Johnson, and Mateo Vasquez Cortez. And Mateo will be doing the presentation today. Oh, so thanks for the, um, for the invitation. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the effect of slavery on elections and political affiliations in Colombia. This is John work with uh, Ali uh, and Marcus. This is part of a like, shared interest in the political dynamics of minorities and Afro-descendants in, in Latin America. And we are very, very happy to, to be part of this initiative. I'm very happy to, to, receive you, to, to participate in the conference and receive the, the comments. So um, here is the, the motivation. Uh, many countries in Latin America consider themselves to be color, colorblind multicultural democracies. In Colombia, for example, uh, it was founded as a representative constitutional democracy in which indigenous land rights were uh, recognized soon after independence, as slavery was abolished in the mid 19th century. Uh, and like, uh, contrary to the US, there is no history of, uh, active, of active race based border suppression. So, based on this uh, narrative, the um, the, prevent, the prevailing argument is that the legacies of slavery were kind of eradicated by uh, erasing the institutionalization of racial categories altogether. So the nation building process based on what is known as, as mestizaje basically made like very difficult to, to estimate the effects or to, to, um, yeah, to see the effects of the slavery, especially on, on political outcomes. Uh, but if we take a closer look at the, uh, the sympathy and closeness to the two main political parties in Colombia, uh, the liberal and the conservative parties, we see that Afro-Colombians uh, support uh, the liberal party more than any other uh, group of citizens. But if you, maybe the, the difference don't see that, that big, but if we consider the sympathy towards the liberal party, among Afro-Colombians compared to the sympathy towards the conservative party, we see a striking big difference. So we see that Afro-Colombians, and this is data from 2004 and 2018 from the La Pop, disproportionately support the, the, the liberal party. So what we ask is what explains this difference in, uh, differences in political behavior in, in general, and what explains the silence of, of race in the, in, in the polit in political participation and attitudes in Latin America in particular. So to answer these questions, there are many possible uh, explanations, ones that are based on economic development and inequality or, or, or racial threats, and border suppression. And we are going to focus on the effect of forced labor institutions on the you know, political and contemporary political outcomes. So what we are going to do in this paper is um, to take the work by uh, Charia, Blackwell, and Sen, and, and, Sen, and study the political legacies of the slavery in, in Colombia. So, yeah, so this is a, a description of the project. So what we do is we, 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 we ask how has the slavery shaped the contemporary political behavior in, in Colombia? Uh, our argument is based on the idea that colonial uh, institutions explain long-term persistence in partisanship. That is, the institution of slavery will have an effect on partisanship in, in the long term. Uh, so what we find in, in the paper is that the findings are the are following. Uh, we provide evidence that places with high concentration of slave persons uh, during, the, during the colony and in the first years of the Republic are more liberal, that means uh, they vote more for the Liberal Party than similar places that share economic and demographic uh, conditions. Uh, 
So basically, in the paper, we look at how um, the, the presence of slavery and the intensity of the institution is related with support to a specific political party in these municipalities. Uh, so the strategy, the identification strategy that we use uh, is based, uh, we use two different identifications. One is based on the paper by Asimoglu, Robinson, and Garcia Jimeno on the effect of the slavery and economic uh, outcomes. Uh, so we use variation in the location of gold and silver mines uh, during the economy. And then we also look at variation in the location and, the, and this is important in the foundation of the Palenques. Uh, Palenques are village of people who escaped the mines and haciendas, the states where enslaved people were used, uh, forced to, to work. And in the context, I'm going to walk you through the, these two important aspects of the, of the institution of slavery in Colombia and uh, explain how they help us to, to, to inform the empirical exercise. And, and finally, in the paper, we discuss what we call like exploring mechanisms that what we try to do is to see how this effect persisted o o over time. So we look at how party system cleavages over abolition and suffrage uh, determine the disaffiliation to the liberal party in some places and the affiliation and like uh, distance to the conservative party. Uh, we, and we also study the intergenerational socialization of attitudes uh, and behavior, uh, both empirically and based on qualitative uh, studies. So this is basically what we do in in the paper, so today in the presentation, what I'm going to do is to go briefly to the, to the context in which I explain some characteristics of uh, slavery and participation in, in Colombia. Then I will go uh, to explain the relationship between slavery and political outcomes in the main argument. Uh, then I will be, be describe the, the results, and the education strategy, and talk a little bit about the, the mechanisms. So I want to point out two, um, two main aspects of the institution of slavery in Colombia. Well, slavery was an important element of the Spanish colonial uh, structure uh, in Colombia, especially after the reduction of indigenous labor force. And the, the two aspects that I want to highlight is one, that slave people were forced to work uh, mostly in mines and large estates. In haciendas, the, the, these mines were located in the Pacific coast of Colombia, and the haciendas were located in the Caribbean region, close to, to, uh, to uh, the Atlantic coast of Cartagena. Uh, and the second uh, important aspect is that uh, as, as, as slavery was growing in the colony, people who escaped from the haciendas and the mines founded the, the Palenques, these villages of people who escaped from the, the mines and, and haciendas. And the, the characteristic of these places is that they were close to where uh, slave people used to work uh, in the mines, given the, the, the geography of the, of the country. So uh, the presence of slavery uh, was gradually spread in the, in the country, so uh, slavery came in waves. So the intensity of the slavery will be the for, uh, therefore correlated with the location and foundation, like the date in which these palenques were uh, initially uh, established. Um, and finally, uh, slavery was, was abolished in 1851 uh, by the Liberal Party. So to give you an idea uh, about the partisanship and uh, important elements of political competition in Colombia, the Liberal Party is uh, supported the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of all, uh, all slave people. They believe in the separation of church and state, opposed to policies of the Spanish colonial uh, state and advocated for decentralization, while the Conservative Party, uh, at least in the 19th century, supported, uh, was supported by land, land owners and elites, was aligned with the church and wanted greater centralization of power and control over a specific uh, fiscal policies. So these were the, the characteristics of the parties. Uh, in the 19th century, and this is a timeline of the like uh, main aspects of the political competition between the two from 1848 to 2002. So be after the creation, sorry, of the of the two parties, we have a uh, control of the Liberal Party. This is when the emancipation took uh, place in 1853. Then we have a period 
hold the hegemony conservadora in which is the control of the conservative party with a new constitution that actually uh, uh, put some restrictions on uh, participation of you know, uh, participation in elections. And then the other two like important elements are the creation of the Frente Nacional, that was an alliance between the two parties as a consequence of continuous civil wars. And when I mean civil wars, I mean many, many years of civil wars between these two parties, meaning that affiliation to one of these two parties was only not, uh, was not only about participation in the, in the ballot box, was also about belonging, belonging to one of the two sides of the of continuous civil wars until the mid uh, 20th century. Uh, and finally, we end up in the new constitution in 1991, and the collapse of the like the traditional two parties in 2002 with the with the victories uh, back to back victories of Alvaro Uribe. So for for the theory we are uh, we are based on the on the idea that um, colonial instit institutions will have a long term effect not only on development but also on political attitudes. So especially the work again by Sharia Blackwell and. The same shows that by uh, informal institutions such as uh, family, uh, the families transmit identities, attitudes, and preferences that can be transmitted across, uh, across generation. And that attitudes that are consistent with uh, uh, formal institutions, for example, uh, slavery, can persist uh, over time, even after those institutions are formally uh, abolished. So this is uh, departing theory and so what we think about now is how this theory uh, applies to the Colombian case. So what we see is that in the post emancipation politics create an enduring repertoire of political behavior that will determine an, an alliance between the Liberal Party and Black communities. A black community is an opportunity to align with the, this political party and what we are going to show is that this initial alliance with the Liberal Party in a context in which the different that the split between liberals and conservatives has been stable over time. We have the, the, the observable implication that the Liberal Party both share or the support of the Liberal Party in places where we have more is slavery is, is positive, meaning that the Liberal Party both share in the 20th century will be positively related to the intensity of, of slavery. So what we are going to do in, in, in Sorry, what we do in the paper is to show the relationship between slavery and support for the Liberal Party across a different set of uh, elections and across a different set of, of years. So the data that we use uh, on slavery is based on the national census in 1843. That's almost 10 years before the, the emancipation. At the municipal level, we have the number of, of the slave ratio, the number of slaves over the the population. Uh, for the electoral votes, we have the results of the elections at the candidate level and the party level from 1972 to 2007. So this is after the Frente Nacional and before the, the collapse of the two-party system. For the Palenques and, and actually the mines, we use the location of these Palenques and the, the foundation date. Uh, for the political attitudes and behavior, we use information for, from, from La Boca. So our uh, benchmark uh, uh, um, empirical exercise looks at the relationship between the effect of slavery on political outcomes. So the, the outcomes here uh, represent party vote shares for presidential and council elections. That is the vote share for the Liberal Party in presidential and council municipality elections. And the treatment variable is the, is the proportion of the fraction of slaves at the municipality level in 1843. And we control by a set of municipal level in controls that include uh, altitude, uh, rainfall, yeah, and other geographical and historical uh, controls. So this is uh, set of results of the OLS. So what we see is that the coefficient of slave ratio on uh, both shares for the Liberal Party is uh, positive uh, on average, and this will be the, the same later. Uh, one standard uh, increase uh, in the one standard deviation increase in the proportion of slaves in, in 1843 is related with a 0.1 standard deviation increase in the both shares for the Liberal Party. As we can see from these four graphs, this is systematic across all, all, all years. We see an interesting decline in the support for the Liberal Party 
in uh, local uh, elections, but nonetheless, we see a systematic positively related, uh, positively effect of uh, slavery in, uh, and support for the liberal party. Nonetheless, uh, we have, we, there are worries about the endogeneity of these estimations. So we tried two different identifications. One is based on the, the location of gold and silver mines that is based on the study by Asimoglu, Robinson and Garcia Jimeno. And the second one that is the one that I'm going to explain here by this system of uh, uh, equation is based on the location and the foundation of the, of the palaces. So we have this system of equations in which equation two is the second stage, equation three is the first stage. And in the first stage, what we try to, to do is um, we try to capture the fact that um, uh, palenques were located close to the places where slaves used to, to work. And we try to capture also the like the phase in that I described in the context section, the, the fact that slavery ca slaves came into waste into the into the country. So the idea is that as we move away from the palenques that were founded earlier, uh, uh, municipalities are farther away from these uh, palenques that were founded uh, earlier, then we have lower levels of uh, slavery. And uh, what we are trying to argue is that this foundation is exogenous to the outcomes of interest. So it's the combination, the interaction of the distance to the palenques with the foundation of the palenque that will give us a better estimation of the uh, slave, uh, slave ration, the proportion of slaves. And this is, um, we think it's interesting because it's in a way, we not only find the effect for the silver and gold mines that Asimoglu and Robinson use, but we try to complement these uh, this is like identification by providing a more precisely estimated. Uh, so this is the, the triangles show the location of the, the, the so important uh, palenques and like darker areas show the, the, the intensity of slavery. And as, as I told you, these uh, places where the slavery was more intense was here in the Pacific coast and the Atlantic, uh, and the Atlantic coast. So what we do is Again, the interaction of the distance to these uh, palenques interacted with the uh, foundation, the year in which they were uh, established. And basically what we find is, uh, this is just a, a summary of some of the results, uh, is, is similar to what we have in the OLS uh, specification. So using the ID strategy, we see that on, on average, Places with high levels of slavery uh, are more liberal, meaning that they vote more disproportionately for the liberal party, and there is uh, is negatively correlated with the support for the conservative party. In this case, when I think the, the interpretation here is one standard deviation increase in the ratio of uh, is, is, uh, slave ratio is associated with a 0. Uh, 16 increase in. Uh, support for the liberal party. So these are uh, important and significant uh, effects. So having shown that, we, this is the, like the main um, result uh, of the paper. We showed this for different elections. We showed this for the whole set of, of election years. This is obviously showing the effect for each of the years, but we have for the, all of the years, we also have the results for other uh, elections in the 19th century. Um, so besides the effect of slavery on support for the liberal uh, party, we study two potential explanations and two like potentially major uh, events that could affect this relationship. So what we call structural science is the consolidation of the conservative party. When we discuss the timeline, uh, there was a time of conservative uh, dominance with a new constitution that actually posed some restrictions on suffrages and the participation of Afro-Colombians and uh, the establishment of a centralized executive uh, authority. So the, the implication, the observable implication in this case is that the proximity to colonial states will moderate the effect of slavery on political outcomes. So as we move away from the capitals, so the departmental capitals, then we will see uh, like higher support for the Liberal Party and more support for the Conservative Party as we are closer to the capital and when we have more presence of the colonial uh, state. So this result um, 
in which I switch the colors, uh, um, shows that as we move away from the, from the departmental capital, there is more support for the liberal path. So the conditional marginal effect of the slave pressure on both shares is greater for the liberal party as we move away from the departmental capitals. And uh, similar result, when we look at the total number of crown employees. So this is a measure of state presence, of colonial state presence. And we see, which is, uh, which is very interesting, that the support for the conservative party actually increases in places with more uh, state presence. So the second mechanism that we explored, the discursive, uh, discursive salience, is the socialization of attitudes across uh, generations. Uh, so while we don't have a, a survey, like within family survey that show us that families support the same party across generation, what we do is to see the support for the Liberal Party across different years in the, in the same in locations. And we are based on anthropological studies and qualitative evidence uh, based on what we have here. This is interviews by Agudelo that has a very good study on the participation of Afro Colombians in, in, in elections in which one person says, uh, I am a liberal by blood. My father and my grandfather were also liberals. And the uh, other one says that everyone should be a revolutionary or at least a liberal. Every black person in Colombia should be a liberal. Uh, so the implication here is that black voters will express greater support for the liberal party than will known black voters and this should be graded in areas with more uh, slavery. So first, uh, across like, called generations, different years, we see that the sympathy and closeness to the Liberal Party is great for uh, Afro-Colombians than from Mestizo and to other uh, citizens. And that the effect of slavery on the sympathy to, to the Liberal Party is greater for uh, Black citizens. So to, to, to finish, we have some additional results in the paper. We studied the consensus of the national front, the alliance between the two parties, and we actually showed that there is a reduction in the support for the Liberal Party and not, and we don't see a reduction in the support for the Conservative uh, Party. We showed the results for the using the identification of the gold mines. We use a reduced uh, sample showing on uh, the effect only for municipalities in the Pacific and the Atlantic regions. We look the effect for additional set of elections for different periods and for different elections. This is election for major. And finally, we look at the effect of slavery on margins of victory to try and capture this idea of the, of the liberal party capturing the political dynamics in, in the municipalities where we had more slavery during the colony. So to conclude, uh, we provide evidence that for labor institutions explain long-term persistence in partnership in, in Colombia. Uh, the politics of abolition and suffrage especially were really important in shaping the geography of dominance of the liberal and conservative parties. So we show that this is structural science explanation explains this, the like strongholds for the liberal party in the Pacific coast of, of Colombia. Uh, we try to say something about the, the intergenerational transmission of uh, mechanisms that it was important in other studies. And uh, at the end, we think that this paper helps to, to, to explain like dynamics about local, low levels of political competition and local participants, uh, participant strongholds that are related with low levels of, of development. We, we try to call the attention of the long-term effect of colonial institutions that may happen this, of these of these factors. So uh, with that, uh, I wish. Right, terrific. Thank you, Mateo. Uh, so both papers are going to be handled by Leticia Arroyo Abad from Queens College. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It is lovely to be surrounded by political scientists. Uh, you tend to be more civilized than economists, so I I may just uh, I may just do it more more often. Uh, <laughs> generally, when I comment, you know, the last the last panel that I was like, oh, we just are going to have our drinks together. Uh, that's not going to happen. So you all <laughs> always drink <laughs> and we see each other again, <laughs> hopefully soon. Uh, so um, it is, so I have the pleasure to comment on these papers. And as an economic historian of Latin America, I know that all of you put like, so much work on putting all this data set together, you know. Um, I'm, I have put data sets together for different things, you know, for Latin America and Golden Nail Time. And we all know how painful the process is. Um, so 
Uh, so I know that these two papers have a lot of work uh, and I'm very impressed of all this data collection. And I have a little bit of data in me, uh, of all this cool data that you have that I wish I could play with. So without further ado, I'm going to start with a paper on slavery in Brazil. Um, so let's start talking about a little bit of what this paper is about and the contributions. Um, as uh, Francois said very well, um, it's really important to know what happened in Brazil in terms of slavery. There are a lot of volumes have been written about slavery in Brazil, but very few papers um, actually look at this persistence and what that means and what we can observe. Uh, slavery was huge in Brazil, as you can see here uh, in the map that I'm showing there. Uh, and what this paper is doing is trying to look at the impact of that slavery has on, um, on persistence in terms of political attitudes and social capital in general. And the mechanism we allude to is intergenerational transmission of cultural norms. So this is something that we haven't seen much in Latin America being done. So I'm really excited uh, about the prospect of learning much more uh, about this, uh, this particular topic. And as a side note, uh, my partner, Noel Maurer, uh, and I were working on a chapter on uh, forced labor in Latin America that was due last week, but we told the editor that we're going to wait another week because, hey, this conference, right? Uh, it was not because we're late. It was just like this conference. So these papers actually are going to uh, really help us uh, to, uh, to actually just get inspired to finish this paper and make the editor really happy. So thank you for the kick. Um, so. Um, what the contribution of this paper is, uh, is, is really important because, uh, of course, it contributes to Brazilian political and economic history overall, uh, and to the long run impact on slavery, especially in Latin America. We, we have read many papers of, about the impact of slavery in the U.S., but in Latin America, there's, from a quantitative point of view, um, I think that it is important and there's room for um, talking much more about this. And um, this paper also built, as Francois uh, said before, on the first chapter of his dissertation, which is a really interesting paper that I wish that you have explained much more in the paper that I had to comment about using um, uh, voting measures for as proxies for elite attitudes. And though that that first chapter of the dissertation is pretty amazing, and I I want more of that on this paper because it just makes so much more sense to. Um, to unpack that a little bit more, but I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So I'm going to give for both papers, I just want you to improve the papers and hopefully I will send you the slide, I promise. Uh, uh, comments in order to uh, improve the paper and hopefully you think of me as referee number one, okay? So I want to accept this paper, I really do. Uh, just like, you know, so do this kind of things. I think that it will be good for you. It's like, you know, uh, uh, like eating oats uh, every day. So they're basically my, my comments uh, fall in two categories. One is um, my, um, some people may say I have a bone with this, uh, is like, you know, the compression of history. Um, just like I wrote my dissertation about persistence in so it's, I've been with this topic for maybe too long at this point uh, so so I'm obsessed with this idea of compression of history and then the other one is uh, just like carving your you know your empirical strategy in a way that is much more understandable and that we can really you know, trace all the arguments throughout all the fantastic work you have done already. So let's start with decompressing history. Uh, I'm going to quote one, uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes about persistence that is from writer, philosopher, Eduardo Galeano, history never really says goodbye, history says, see you later. So it's not that I don't believe in persistence. We see persistence everywhere. It's just, I want a really compelling history, you know, like story about persistence. Just show me your persistence. Show me it throughout history, right? So in a nutshell, what this paper is looking at is slavery in 1872 and really bad things happen later on, you know, just to, to put it really, really bluntly. And one of the 
one of the issues I have with persistence paper is like something happened, you know, really back in time. And then we see things today um, in the middle, nothing, apparently nothing happened. I don't know, we just assumed that something happened and persisted. You know, there's so many papers about that. And, uh, and it's a problem because I'm an economic historian. So I just care about the history in the middle and I just like having a job. But, um, but on top of that, it just, I don't know what happened in the middle, the reverses of fortunes or not. And Francois, you have buried a lot of stuff on table nine. And I'm going to ask you that to make it like not table nine, much, much earlier, right? So you have here, you have intermediate outcomes, which is something that you don't see a lot in persistence papers because it's really hard to get the data and you have it. So front it, show it, like show us the data that is pretty amazing. Uh, and also, um, and I have to come clean here, I'm Argentinian, um, is this nominal? You know, I, I always care about inflation. Uh, so I have no idea what's happening here. So it says uh, by year, but I'm not sure it's nominal real, which makes really hard for me to understand the coefficients because there was inflation. How do we know that it was inflation in Brazil, right? Uh, so. You have to just tell me if it's okay. first, if it's nominal, just make it real so that all the coefficients mean actually the same to me. And so also because this table is buried at the end, uh, it's not really counted properly. I just want to know more. And I just really having a lot of trouble understanding the interaction effects and the, you know, the net, what is the net effect? Uh, of you know of your of your regressors, I I just really have a lot of trouble. So I just recommend just put it earlier and explain like as five uh, what is happening here. So that the problem of uh, compression of history, I think, is fairly easy for you to to unpack because you have the data. So I'm not asking you to go to the archives. Um, which people tell me all the time um, that like, you need to control by this. It's like, yeah, download my data.com is really useful in historical settings. So in this case, I'm not asking you to get more data, just like, you know, what you have, just make a much more compelling case. So let's go with uh, empirical strategy. And my caveat is that I'm not an econometrician. I can only play it on Zoom TV. So, uh, so but what I would like to see in this paper is that empirical strategy to spell out clearly. There's a lot of moving parts here and some of the outcomes, I think I'd run out of space. You have lots and lots of outcomes. And um, so explain why all these outcomes matter. Yes, there are development outcomes, uh, there are different dates, uh, just I need a more cohesive story. Why are you just showing all this? Because you know, we have data, so we want to show it, but um, just like tell us a story about how all these outcomes are related, how they go together or not. Just make it a little package with a bow for us. The other issue I have, which you actually just talked about it in your presentation and also just in a footnote, is that the unit of analysis. And Brazil, like many Latin American countries, uh, has just like multiplied the municipalities over time. And as you can see uh, there, it went from 600 to like over 5,000, you know, from 18, you know, late 19th century till, you know, the 2000s. So this poses a problem. You just explain how you actually solve that problem. Uh, but on the right-hand side, you see the 1940 um, districts versus the 2000s. And you see like, you know, that there are some districts um, are really big and some are just, you know, very fragmented over time. And this is not just in places where um, there, there were not that many people in colonial times. These are places that actually just have quite a bit of a high population density. So this is everywhere. So I would suggest that you look at another methodology that uh, Michael Oppel has developed um, for 2015, but also uh, Lambe, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, in 2018, I actually just used it to look at the impact of quilombos in Brazil to create this, what is called as virtual municipalities. And I think that uh, James Feigenbaum also did it for, for the US uh, when you have fragmentation of municipalities, counties, uh, to see, because it's really hard to understand 
how you can assign the same type of treatment, quote unquote, on regions that are just so, so large. Um, so I think that that would be a useful exercise to do. And I know you're a GI as well, so I'm sure that you can do it. So now let's talk instruments. So there are a bunch of instruments that you use and the most intriguing one, and I say intriguing now because I'm trying to be cute, is intriguing because I have no idea what, what's happening here. Is this generating instruments that you develop in your first chapter of the dissertation, but is, they're not explained. So I, it is a black box that I would like to know because maybe I just would like to use it for my own paper. So it's just for me mostly, right? So just help me uh, to, to figure out like, hey, I can generate instruments and not just think about instruments. I want that recipe now, okay? So, so explain that. Given that you actually wrote the first chapter of dissertation about this, it shouldn't be that hard. It's just that it's not there. And um, so, so please uh, do that for me and for humanity. Um, the other um, issue is that one of the instruments deals with uh, repression of indigenous people. And you claim that, you know, yes, it was repression, but there's no persistence of that. There's no persistent effect of the repression of indigenous people. And this is something that I struggle with with the persistent literature. Yes, there is persistent or there's no persistent or the persistent, you know, fades away, but who, how, who are we to turn it on and off, right? So in order to know that it doesn't persist, we have to show that it doesn't persist. And it's really hard to think that repression of indigenous people uh, do not have an impact over time, knowing the history of Latin America overall. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, a colleague of mine that is not in the audience, I shall remain nameless, said like, hey, you're Argentinian, don't pretend that you know anything about Brazil or Mexico, uh, Brazil, or Colombia, which is, happens to be true, but I know quite a bit about Argentina, Mexico and Peru. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around as like, why, Slavery was bad, bad institution, course of institution, repression of indigenous people, by bad institution, but it doesn't persist. So I'm not saying you're you're wrong. What I'm saying is like, show me that this is true, just not just tell me. Um, so that I'm convinced that this is this persistence does not matter and it's a valid instrument. Uh, the other thing that is also um, as as you uh, probably learned about me, I lab maps. I really, really, really like maps. So, uh, and in order to create this instrument, you use the map, I, I think it's by BG or uh, uh, the Fundazao uh, de Uh And um, and those maps for the 16th to 18th century were just kind of like, let's say, you know, like wishful thinking in some way. So trying to trace those things really accurately to assign to particular districts or municipalities may be problematic. So you may need to do some robustness checks that then, you know, they're switching around, this boundaries are not going to really just change your effect, you know, like your results overall. Because these maps we know, um, you know, you, you've seen probably like old maps, they just didn't even know where things were much. Uh, so it's just really hard to take them as gospel. Um, so bad robustness checks will, will help uh, dispel some doubts of the skeptical people like myself. Now, you have lots and lots of controls and covariates, like amazing, amazing amount of data, pretty amazing. Now, let's talk Quilombos. Um, the problem that I have with Quilombos is that they may be correlated with treatment. Uh, and I would like to see a map of the Quilombos. So, uh, because what is interesting about Quilombos as well is that they did persist over time. You know, it's just incredibly famous and it's just, you know, you can map them today. So there, I just looked around and apparently there are people that are just mapping these Quilombos. You know, it's, there's a, a, a citation there. You may just want to check. Uh, it's also, and this is the project that I am working on with other people about this, you know, fragmentation uh, of districts of municipalities in Brazil over time. that the fragmentation of the municipality is not random. And the presence of a quilombo may actually just break apart the municipality in order to, you know, just get public goods in some ways or just avoid a quilombo. Uh, it's, so, so the presence of quilombo and the fragmentation of districts, those two things are endogenous. So 
and not all quilombos were created equal, just that some were larger, some were smaller. And I told you I like maps. So you gave me an excuse to actually look for a map. So I just, you know, like did it quickly this morning. So just looked at one of the sources that you uh, cited and it had a shape file. So here are the, you know, the dark spots there are the quilombos and, you know, they're in this particular source that are 435 or so. So you see some of them are larger, some are smaller. And, uh, and you see how this maps through uh, the fragmentation of municipalities in Brazil overall. So I'm worried about quilombos being endogenous and are not a covariate uh, like that. You're not controlling for quilombos. Quilombos are actually part of the story. And finally, um, another issue that I generally uh, pick on the persistence literature is the question of mechanisms, right? Um, because in order to believe that, that some institution persisted over time, it has to either just the same institution just survive over time or just like transform or just affect other institutions, like for example, public goods, right? Public provision. And the persistence the, the mechanisms that you quote here are contemporaneous with the outcomes. So I don't have, I can attract, you know, slavery in Brazil to like some kind of mechanism over time because all this, you know, intergenerational transmission of cultural norms, I don't observe them over time. I only observe them today. You observe them today. So that is, um, that is what, um, I'm concerned about, and I know it's really hard. So, but you don't need like extreme quantitative in evidence for this. What you need is to actually tell the stories and show us, you know, how you can track this over time, maybe with other indicators. Okay, so I'm going to stop now because I talked a lot, and I have to another paper to comment. Um, so now we're moving from Brazil to Colombia. So, and I want a cup of coffee now. Uh, so, this is a great paper. I was really interested. Uh, Colombia is something that uh, is very intriguing. It's one of the things about forced labor that I'm working on right now. So, I have a huge data envy about the encomienda situation that map that you have there. Uh, I think this, this, uh, this paper, I like this paper a lot, as the same as the, as, as the paper in Brazil, because we're just decentering, you know, like we're just taking, we're getting out of the US and just looking at what happens with racial relations and just in political systems in Latin America. And the question of party identification, racial politics, you know, together with like, you know, the long shadow of labor for Chicago uh, art. These two papers that speak to that and just like, you know, living in the US myself, you know, just and having survived the last administration and trying to um, move forward, just this is really interesting to see this contrast. And 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 I I have uh, really enjoyed uh, these two papers uh, overall. So once again, I'm going with the same recipe: how to improve this paper, being referee number one. So I have three buckets of recommendation. One is play out the persistence game in a good way. Uh, because you have panel data and that is cool. Uh, the second one is uh, do your best to, you know, to rail in the identification, you know, counts, uh, clean up the identification and disentangle the mechanisms overall. And then I'm going to make a bold suggestion uh, that historians never do is look at the recent past or like the present that, you know, most economists look, think. Uh, so let me just go uh, each one in turn. So play a persistence. Your abstract should be much more, it's much more, in, you know, your paper is much more interesting than your abstract. You do much more than what your abstract says. So it's just like, you know, the abstract is where people decide whether you read your paper or not. So just like make it better because you do much more than what the abstract says. Uh, because, you know, honestly, I read the abstract like, oh, this is a typical paper for systems. Something happened a long time ago, and then we see today, um, end of story. And no, your paper is much more than that. Um, there is a gap, and you explain it, you know, from the 1850s to the 1970s. And I'm just, you know, the data constraints do. Oh, look, 
I have coffee. Uh, ask and you shall receive. I, I want Jeff's puppy too. Can I get that? Because, <laughs> because I saw how that puppy was looking at Jeff with love. I don't get that in life. Uh, so, um, so, um, so I know I, I, I'm not going to be the obnoxious economist saying like, why don't you get the data for the other elections? But on the other hand, there's so much stuff that happened during that period of time. And just, you know, just like, you know, appealing to my fragmented memory about that. The 1863 constitution changed, you know, vote from direct to indirect vote. And then because of that, the Congress elected the president in 1876. Those things matter, right? So I, in 100 year gap, I understand that data constraints, but still, if there's some way that you can get data and doesn't just, you know, make your life totally miserable, it will be actually fantastic. Um, so that is um, uh, that is something that um, I know it's, I feel bad asking you to get more data because I know it's really hard, but, but I get hard to say it, sorry. Uh, so then let's go to endogeneity. Um, so in a nutshell, um, I'm just showing you the instruments that uh, this paper uses. One is a gold mine dummy, uh, for lack of better uh, sophisticated term for my part. And uh, the other one, which is super interesting, is a Palenque distance uh, interactive with the foundation here. Palenque, um, Palenques are like, you know, you have Quilombos in Brazil, Palenques in Colombia, Palenques also in, um, in Mexico. Um, so these are settlements where runaway slaves just went to and escape. Uh, from the brutality of, of slavery. So that is like a really interesting story. And um, there are some things I would like to know uh, so that I just um, don't think that it's endogenous because, you know, endogeneity is the bane of the social science existence. So, so let's look at a couple of things. So here you have um, data on gold production in New Granada, that's you know, what Colombia was part of, and most of the mines were in Colombia. So it's safe to say that most of this gold was uh, mined in Colombia. And as you can see, gold production was not the same over time, which means that, and also this is the, you know, the, the toll of gold production. So different mines went on and off at different times, which means that the intensity of slavery was different depending on the time period and also depending on what mind we're talking about. So, uh, and so I'm concerned about that. I'm I just, so I, I'm sure there is probably, I don't know enough Colombian history to dispel this concern I have, but it, if it's easy to solve, maybe just put it in a footnote. Um, the, the paper says that the depletion of mines, it just, you know, made sure that, you know, the, 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 that the institution, you know, just didn't persist. Uh, but the other people, much smarter than I am, like Ashimogulu, Johnson and Robinson, and Melissa Dell, that to tell you that the depletion of a mine does not mean that an institution is going to die. Uh, so um, those are the persistence, you know, supporters argue that, that, you know, just that because there's no more mining doesn't mean that you have not created an institution that is going to persist over time. So that is not a, an argument that I'm super convinced about. The other thing is that is related to, um, you know, the presence of gold mines overall, is that um, I can think of a mine being depleted or just, you know, the production just going down substantially and the mine owner having slaves but it's not going to coerce them. It could just coercion could go two ways. It could coerce them more in order to get more, more you know, more, uh, more gold, or it coerce them less and just it would be easier for the slave to run away. So it's not clear to me because you have as you know, as Shemola Walensky has said, like it's a question of effort versus outside options, which one plays uh, in order to actually think about this instrument to, to be uh, valid overall. Uh, And then, well, this is just because I just don't, I just don't know what to believe in life anymore. Initially, the F test used to be 10, then they told me 12, and now there's a paper with 100. I don't know what to do with life. I'm just like, throw it out there. Just you, you kids do whatever you want. But I'm just telling you now the other case that says 100, and I just don't know. Um, so if this is actually what we all have to do, um, just 
send your papers by publication now because an F of 100, I'm not sure who gets it. Uh, so I'm just throwing it there. Just do it whatever you want. Uh, then the other thing that I'm a little bit obsessed about, I have to confess, is the case of encomiendas. And encomiendas, as many of you know or not, uh, is just one of the initial, um, is the initial forced labor institution that the Spaniards um, established in Latin America. Colombia was not an exception. And initially, just, you know, mining was done through the encomienda system and it was called Mita de Minas. So you use encomiendas as a control. And I'm saying like, is it a control or is another, I'm really sorry, I'm going to use this word, endogenous. <laughs> I'm sorry, I use the E word. Uh, so, convince me is not, I, I, I can be convinced. Um, there's a large literature about encomienda that I'm trying to learn more about there. Um, you used um, the data from Ashimoglu et al. for location of encomiendas. Um, the, the original sources are Tovar and Luis Rivera. So you can just read these books um, to actually tell me a story that I shouldn't worry about that. Um, now, the other uh, thing is, of course, identification. And, um, and this is common with persistence papers that we don't track people. We actually track places. And the problem with tracking places is that people like moving to other places. And in the case of Colombia, this is really bad, uh, how many people moved around. So here's some data for you that I'm sure you know that in 2019, there's a statistic of 5.6 million people. Um, there's around 11% of the population were displaced because of la violencia. Uh, and, uh, and it affects 90% of the municipalities. So it's not that it's like one little region, it's everywhere. So, so the question is, what are we identifying? Are just people uh, you know, voting with their feet? They just go where you know, they just have people that they think like them and just are voting like together. So that um, you say, so that I can show you, I told you I like maps. Um, so here is, there are two maps. This is only, I just was able to get it for it. I didn't make these maps, I'm gonna confess. I just borrow them. Uh, so you have a geographic distribution of displacement for 1999, 2008, and you have the darker the color is the more people that were displaced. And uh, you have expelling municipalities and receiving municipalities. So migration is always a problem. It's always a problem. Now, how to solve it? I'm sorry, I don't have it good, but you, you have to, in some way I had to fly it because the question of migration, it just means that maybe just, you just like, what you identify is people just moving to places that, you know, people like-minded people, right? Um, so, uh, but it, it is what it is, right? Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm almost done people, I'm almost done. So, um, I love the, the I learned I learned two new phrases. So thank you, uh, discursive salience and structural salience. I thought it was our philosophy class. So thank you for expanding my vocabulary. I just feel much smarter. Uh, so um, so now the question is, and this is where I'm just going to not be a historian, I'm just going to be like a, an economist thinking about what can we do today? Is are these two saliences both operating? Are they reinforcing each other? Or maybe we can actually identify it. And how can we do that? We can look at after 2006 because you have you know, the collapse of the two party system. You have a proliferation of parties. So you can actually see whether people that used to be just, you know, the afro descendants which is, are very affiliated with the liberal party. Now that the whole, you know, system just like collapsed, blew up, whether they, actually vote liberal or whatever part of it is, it's a question of ideology or a question of the political machine. So you can actually just test this mechanism, which one is operating. So that I think is super cool. And it may, uh, I'm going to give credit of this to, to my partner here that uh, gave me the suggestion. So it was not my brilliant idea, but we were both inspired by um, the US. So it's just a think of Colombia in the US, um, parenthesis, broken mirror, uh, or maybe I just want the US to actually abolish the two-party system. I just want to live the curse in through Colombia. Uh, I don't know, it's not a clear experiment for me to identify what my motivation is, but I think that you can actually just identify the mechanisms, you know, disentangle them, by just looking after 2006 and just the 2006 is not, you know, 
It's not a bug, it's actually a feature. But thanks for listening to me and uh, saying this late. Uh, and it was really great uh, reading these papers. Thank you. Uh, to the authors, any any response to Leticia at all? Francois? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the, the great comments. Uh, this is uh, incredibly uh, helpful. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, try to answer a few of the, of the comments. Uh, on intermediate outcomes, uh, I fully agree. Uh, I'll definitely give uh, table nine uh, the importance uh, it deserves. Um, and uh, I also plan to uh, look at earlier uh, political outcomes, uh, which uh, may also help uh, alleviate your uh, concern about uh, outcomes versus mechanisms. Um, it should be clearer, but uh, all the reais are in uh, year 2000 reais. So nothing is, uh, is uh, nominal. Um, then uh, explain uh, better the first chapter and uh, the empirical strategy also, uh, I fully agree. Uh, when I first started uh, uh, thinking about this paper, I had uh, like a short uh, 20, paper, 20 pages paper in mind uh, with a very clear uh, mechanism and uh, reality turned out a bit more uh, complicated. So uh, I have been a bit struggling with uh, explaining everything the best I can in as few words uh, as possible, but uh, I totally uh, take the point. Uh, quilombos are endogenous, uh, also I fully agree. Actually in the other paper uh, with Arthur, we, we have uh, an instrument for quilombos, uh, which I did not transfer to, to this paper because here they, they play kind of a lesser role uh, in this case, but uh, I, again, I definitely take the point. And ind indigenous repression also a uh, point taken, uh, I agree. And uh, I think this should be clear, but I think the point is not necessarily that uh, indigenous repression had no impact uh, overall, uh, more that uh, it was relatively homogeneous along the places we consider. So it's unlikely to be correlated with differences in the outcomes. Uh, and uh, so it should not affect what we see within provinces. But uh, again, I, I, I fully agree. So yeah, thanks again uh, for the, the, all the great comments. And I, uh, I definitely need the slides. Uh, Matteo? Yeah, no, I just want to say um, thank you. I think all the comments are well, well taken uh, on the on the instrument of, of the mines. We have thought about that and we have been thinking how to deal with this problem. Also about the the endogeneity of the of the encomiendas, if we should control or not for the for the encomiendas. We are going to look at um, other election cycles before the ones that we are studying and we are going Definitely, we're going to explore the suggestion of looking at the election after 2006. We have those, we have the, that data, so we are going to do that to say something more about the, the mechanisms. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Ali, did you have anything? Or Marcus, if you're still here? Either of you? Um, no, I think Leticia's point, especially about um, the instruments, is valid. Um, I think we probably need to do a bit more research on the Palenque, the establishment, and see um, if there's reason to suspect the year when they're established. There's some exogeneity because, um, in, in some way, the, the, the reason why they were established was changes in uh, how enforcement of the uh, of the course of labor institution worked, uh, and so if there's you know kind of shocks to the Spanish crown, uh, sending funds to reinforce course of labor institutions, that may explain why there's differences over time and when the establishment of the Palenque happened. So if we find evidence, historical evidence to support that fact, we may be able to argue exogeneity and timing. Uh, but we still have to do, like you mentioned, the historical work of actually figuring out, you know, what was the reason why they were founded and when. But thank you so much. And uh, one one quick, you know, follow up to that because I forgot to say it before. So the other thing that you should just try to figure out is what there was some Palenque destination because maybe the slaves just went first to the nearest one, but then there was one Palenque that was like, you know, super cool. And then they just they went to the other one. So then uh, I don't know that because in Brazil there were some quilombos that were super you know famous and just people moved there. Uh, so, but I don't know in the case of Colombia. So that you know just just do the the research and I, I forgot to say that, but you know to to keep that in mind. Thank you. Yeah, if I could just just jump in. I mean, thank you so much, Leticia, for those comments and. 
Is that a quick clarifying question? So you're saying that if we look at elections beyond 2006 and we see persistence, then that might help to hint toward the mechanism not being, uh, you know, ideological attachments or socialization, but instead something else. I just wanted to clarify that that comment there. It's very helpful. Yeah. So so you say that there are two kind of saliences, right? Uh, that's what the vocabulary for today. Uh, so so you can just identify, you know, to so disentangle which one is operating. If it's, you know, a question of political, you know, political affiliation, or it's a question of, you know, ideology, just uh, because you you actually do like what that party is saying for you, right? So, so I think of it from in the terms of what happens with, the, you know, the Democratic Party here in the U.S. Uh, uh, so if you think of that time, in that kind of mindset, you can just apply it to Colombia uh, in that sense. That is what it's like. Um, that's what I was thinking about. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I guess uh, I guess we're done. We got through the six papers. I'm, I'm, I was very pleased by by the quality of the papers and um, the quality of the discussion. And Leticia, you'll you'll pass on your slides as well to the authors. I'm sure they definitely uh, appreciate that. In terms of next steps, we lost some of the authors uh, because we we were going a little late. Uh, so I'll follow up with everybody by email. But I don't need the revised papers right away. Um, I have this plan for the third issue of the journal. So given that this is April 6th now, I could probably give you until early June to get the final papers in, which should be given teaching schedules and COVID and everything like that. And I probably have some flexibility beyond that, although I probably shouldn't have said that, right? But um, yeah, I don't need, I don't need a, an immediate turnaround. But I'll be in touch with you probably by the in the next couple of days with some more information about that. Um, but thanks for being thanks to everyone the the, the paper givers, the discussants, uh, the the people who were simply attendees today. Uh, it was a great symposium, and I was very pleased to spend a good chunk of my day with you. And again, as as always, thanks to. Aubrey Hicks and, and Ann Johnson at the Bedrosian Center who make all of this possible and all of this easy for me. Uh, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thanks, everyone. Leticia, it was good to meet you virtually. <laughs> and, and have a good rest of the day, everybody.